Hello and welcome to Synoptic Summit presentation of the new advanced budgeting and forecast solution. On our agenda today, we'll be looking at what it takes in the understanding the importance of budgeting accuracy, there will be a review of our budgeting process, and then a look at the new advanced budgeting and forecasting solution in and of itself. Our objective is to provide insight to our advanced budgeting and forecasting solution, show its functionality and the associated technology that provides increased accuracy and minimizes the work and effort it normally takes to develop a corporate budget. What we want to be able to provide you with would be the speed with which to conclude the budgeting exercise sooner, accuracy that executives can depend on, visibility into every business sector's budget detail, and collaboration to ensure the budget is achievable. Let's start off by looking at what is a successful business. It is a business that creates a sustainable and superior return on investment to their shareholders or entrepreneurs or the investors and financial institutions. It is accomplished by applying keen business vision and sound business sense. In order to be able to apply those, we need budgeting and forecasting and business planning as the process used by management to create the blueprint for achieving such success. To borrow a quote from an unknown author, facts are the foot soldiers in the army of persuasion, and we need those facts to be able to bring about an accurate budget for which we're able to do many, many things in order to be able to make sure that the business is successful and that we can convince outside investors, shareholders, and all financiers that that is the business that they could and should invest in. Let's take a look at why is accuracy important. Budgeting, forecasting and business planning is the process used to create the blueprint or roadmap for a business success. A budget provides essential information for operating within your means, very important. Managing unexpected challenges, very important. And turning a profit where we need to know which and how many of the products are at least contributing a minimum of a contribution margin to the bottom line. It's ac the accuracy is important so that you can set accurate set of defined achievable financial goals, objectives and guidelines for the, co for the corporation to achieve success. Now the achievable financial goals and objectives are exceptionally important because so many companies in many instances will go out and set targets that are unachievable in the hope that they will get there. That is not a good budget, it's not accurate, and it creates a multiple number of problems, uh, whether it be overstocked inventory to try and uh, cater to those goals, um, whether it be setting the targets for commissions and for sales reps to uh, try and ach achieve their plan and they don't. All of those are challenges. But a budget is important, the accuracy is important because it enables the business executives and or owners to concentrate on things that are more important, like cash flow, like reducing costs, improving profits, and increasing the return on investment. Those are exceptional things that they should be concerned about and not with budget variances here, there, and everywhere through bad budgeting. It also helps with planning and control of the finances of the business. That's what we're there for. Every business is there to be able to make money. And if you don't have those capabilities, if you don't have those uh, blueprints or guidelines, then where are you going with a business? Or are you just shooting in the dark, just like a shotgun approach? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Let's rather look at a laser focused aim and fire. It's also important because it provides validation and confidence, a very important one, to shareholders, boards of directions, but directors and financial leading institutions, which give 
confidence that the executive and the management team clearly understand their business and can achieve their goals. Let's have a look at the budgeting types that we have out there. We have top-down or the imposed budget. That's where the executives define what the objectives need to be and, and how the company needs to achieve them. And they go about disseminating that through to the rest of the organization in the hopes that we would achieve that. But it is likely to perpetuate some inefficiencies because it's taken normally last year's expectations or last year's results and rolling them into the next year's budget. So certain things that may have existed were not necessarily eliminated in terms of costs and or revenue streams that may need to be identified differently or defined differently. It is also likely to result in budgetary stretch, a huge problem normally with an over exuberant look at, at growth. And so there's overstated expectations on sales revenue and sometimes an overstated reduction in cost that maybe is not achievable and so makes the budget uh, worthless as an, ex as an exercise. It's also likely to ignore both internal and external drivers of activity and performance, the likes of which is your utilization of the equipment, your efficiencies, marketing uh, matters that are pertinent to the product, the market on how it's, it's changing, the competitors, etc. So that's not normally the best way to do it, but it is a method and we cater to that. Then there's the bottom up, which is the participative budget, where managers must be able to justify every single expense. But this is an extremely time consuming approach and can result in budgetary slack where managers understate the revenue and maybe overstate costs to be able to always be within their budget. This approach, however, if done well, is good for cost containment, a financial restructuring, or major economic or market downturn. The solution to all of that is the third portion of, of which we are proponents, and what we do is we create the negotiated or integrated hybrid budget, which is a combination of both top-down and bottom-up budgeting methods, the way the executives outline the targets that they would like to attain, and the managers then together with the employees, uh, refine that budget so that we have increased involvement and an improved efficiency and accuracy and an acceptance from all. Let's look at our budget process flow. How do we anticipate that we will work with you to be able to achieve the end result, which is gaining all this information so that we can build the budget? How do we build the budget and what does it look like at the end and how fast do you get that information? So let's start at the beginning. And one of the things that we do is we gather the information in stage one, uh, gather information from the executive assumptions. In other words, what is a growth percentage, profitability percentage, EBITDA expectations, and cost reduction expectations. Those will be more financially driven and we look to build a P&L statement from those assumptions. We also have the information as it relates to the sales portion of this, which would involve things like the customers, the products, the discounts. And from that, we would be able to build templates and we would populate those templates with information. Likewise, we would do that with production, we'd create templates, but using an understanding what it needs to be built with, the likes of the shift, the cost centers, the efficiencies, utilization, etc., and also with the likes of the labor portion, which is from human resources, where we determine labor rates, overtime rates, and company contributions. All of this is used to build, first of all, the executive target or the corporate PL. And the corporate PL will then be built using what you currently have or what you expect to report on. In some cases, uh, Sales might be well consolidated as cost of sales might be consolidated by groups of, or, or, or sales groups as opposed to the individual sales account. But we'll create that so that we can then build the information at a higher level and extrapolate that across the entire organization going forward. Once we have that information, we work with the CFO, head of sales, COO, CEO to identify 
how they normally report. So what does the company structure look like? And in this case, we have a company structure where we have a VP of East, VP of the West, customers A, B, C, and D, and the products that they take. We could take this to whatever level and however many levels we'd like to build in there, but we use this as our corporate hierarchical structure whereby we take the information from the executive target and the assumptions. We look at the structure that you may have had in existence from the prior year or that you expect to have in the new year. We take last year's and identify what percentages these products might contribute to the overall sales as an example. And then we'll take the expected returns and the expected growth and extrapolate along the same lines into the templates that we have for the sales by product, and then that would drive production and also the labor. We help to build and identify what information is required on the sales template, the production template, the labor, and the Air Finance and SGNA. We'll build these out, identify them, and show how they need to be uh, populated. And then when we run the, uh, the system and we publish the sheets, the system will take all the information that comes out of the executive assumptions via this information here, which is the sales breakdown, to create the sales templates that will help to generate what goes on in the production templates, and that would generate the labor. SGNA, those would be separate, and the expenses would be done by each department if they so choose to do it. And the, and the sales or finance team would do the SGNA in the appropriate fashion. We would then take all that information and help once the information has been populated, and we would work with the sales teams to refine the dollar value and the quantities. We'll help production to look at their labor review, material utilization, efficiencies, hours, and overhead. And we will do the likewise with the labor and finance on their expenses and how they expect to show certain things like depreciation. Um, and then we basically consolidate all that information under the finance and we compare it to the executive review so that we can see how the fine, the fine tuning of the executive target compares with what the executives had identified to begin with. With that, let's take a look at the functionality within advanced budgeting. Now let's go and take a look at the solution itself. When getting into the Synoptics budgeting solution menu, you will find that it is found here on the hamburger stack menu, budgeting and forecasting with all the subsections that we would access and drive the budgeting solution. What we're going to look at right now starts here with a setup and that's where we would ideally go and identify the and set up all the details as it relates to the uh, global variables and your setup screens for other data that you would like to use. Let's have a look at the the global variables for that matter first. The global variables, as we said, these are to be used with the executive target as an example. And here you would have the proposed increases to product A, product B, your cost of goods, ideal cost of goods percentage you'd like to have as, as a percentage of sales, your total gross profit, G&A expense, etc. So you could identify the expected results that the executives have, and that's what they would generally use to be able to build out the executive target. Notwithstanding that, we have the ability to also create alter other and alternative uh, forms that will house certain data, like we have in the apportion method. Uh, we've got machines, finishing machines, um, assembly machines, and within and each and every one of these, <coughs> we have got what the allocation might be as we spread that for the overhead burden. Now, the way that this would work is that we would create these forms for you ahead of time, as we discussed in the, in the prior uh, PowerPoint presentation. And then we would go and have a look at building a template for you to be able to create an executive target. The way the executive target works 
is that we identify the company and then we will identify the accounts that we would like to bring into any one of these uh, lines that we're going to uh, the budget uh, a budget on. So in this case we have motorboat sales. Motorboat sales comprises of two or three or four more accounts as we can see here. If we validate that that will be the motorboat sales and we would then bring them in into that line. If I choose I could do a host of accounts, bring them in here as a, as a group name, identify them as a group and put in the name that I'd like and if I now add that row it will add it into one of the lines here. We're not going to do that because I really don't want to mess with the template and so we will just take that all the way back and out of there. <clears throat> Now, having said that, once the template has been created, we would then identify also how we'd like to increase and build out the expectation. Here we had the increase, as we said, uh, for product A. For product B, you could also put in a manual percentage change if you choose, or you could select it from the global variables that we have set up here. Like, for instance, in, in the case of cost of goods, if we wanted to identify that that was what that number needed to be. It works on a simple platform of, of calculations too and then we identified that the target will be the increase last year's number multiplied by the increases as ever we want them to come up with a number that the executives expect and the way that what that would look like would be something like this. Not unfamiliar to everybody it's, a, it's an income statement and this would show what the target would be and what they'd like to have going forward all the way through to the P&L, to the profit margin. Once we've had a look at that um, and we've defined that, we would then go and build the uh, hierarchical structure. That hierarchical structure is literally something that is um, highlighted by the Break down as deep as you want to, whatever number of layers you'd like to have this. We could have it as shallow as just the VP of the East and the West, both of which, in the case of the sales account that we are spreading here, this is going to be 40% of the East, 60% to the West. And if that was the only way, um, we would identify that. And you can see that they all add up to 100%. Always have to, any number of splits will always be down to 100% so that you never lose sight of the accuracy of the number. We could break this down into further numbers or further layers just like we have here into the dealers A and B and within the dealers by virtue of the products that they take so that as we go and publish the sheets you'll see we publish the detail sheets we identify the templates that will be created as well as the associated production details that will be linked to these templates. We'll see exactly what that looks like. Once I publish the she these sheets, the information that is going to be taken straight from the executive target is going to be applied along the lines of the percentages that we have here for each and every one of those accounts so that we end up with a template that looks like this, where this number represents the portion of its previous year's contribution now linked to the new targeted global assumption or the executive target number. Now here we have a template that identifies last year's numbers. It doesn't have to be that way but you could have last year's plus the year before to give an example as well as the set of numbers as a guideline and then these lines in green are where the managers and the operation folks will go in and make the appropriate changes. So if I made the change and doubled that number because I felt that I could double it. You will see that it changed both the uh, volume, the dollar value, as well as the quantity. And if on the quantity I brought this down to nine dollars, then you will see that I've actually increased the number of units that I would have to have in order to uh, meet the appropriate uh, adjusted sales as I have them there. So let's go back to my total sales and back to my 15 and we'll have that same number because that number makes up the total uh, units that have to be produced that we will then carry forward into the production statement. 
When I am solidly ready to publish these numbers or to recommend them, I could have as many iterations as I want. I would either save it uh, to be approved at a later stage so that I don't lose this detail. But when I'm ready to have a version of this, I would save it as, as I've done here. And in this case, I've recommended it. <clears throat> the minute I recommend it, it takes the numbers that we have here, both on the sales dollar side, on the units of the units of sale, as well as any of the deductions that I may have, and it carries it forward into the future uh, documents that we will see, which would be the likes of the income statement and all the production planning, which is where we're going to go next. But here you can see I have yet a different uh, sheet because we have a sheet for each one so that each uh, manager or each person who may be handling, for instance, bass boats for dealer A would also have the numbers that they could then go in and make the appropriate adjustments to, recommend it, and move on. When that's all said and done, these numbers all get calculated together and they get carried forward into what we have as the production hours. This is really nothing more than uh, a document of consolidated sets of numbers that say, for the wake setting boats across all customers and for all products for all the wake boats that are being sold we're going to sell 679 wake boats and we know that at some point in time we may want to increase some of this production which is where your production manager will come in and look to make some appropriate adjustments which in this instance he had decided <coughs> that um, because we started to build up a inventory level, let's say from December, it took 25% of December's number and put that into 25% uh, of January's number, built that into December. So we only have 75% of January to make, but we're also going to make 25% of February, and we could actually add that formula to add more into March, April, and May. In some cases, we have uh, folks that are building out inventory so that their customers are not caught out with this current supply chain problem up to uh, several months ahead of time. Now, that also means a number of other things, and that is the preparation of uh, what you'd need to produce is going to be what you're going to have to buy. And in some cases, you may have to buy materials a little bit uh, later on to identify another problem, and that is your supply of your materials to yourself. These numbers are then carried forward into the next document, which I've combined for the sake of convenience into um, this document here, which is the hierarchical structure path for machining, uh, I mean, for the machining department, finishing department, and assembly department. And here we've just done something uh, to highlight how this gets calculated and where, for instance, your production manager would go in and make the adjustments if he could to be able to bring additional value to the bottom line. Let's have a look at this. We got eight hour shifts, 40 hours per week. And effectively here, I want to just point out that this is where the machine utilization is only at 75%, and that might well be because you've got a half an hour for lunch or an hour for lunch and 15 minutes for uh, tea times or coffee breaks. If you, mean to, if you need to change that, you could change that, and ultimately those breaks will then bring that up to a different set of numbers. Instead of having six out of eight hours, maybe you do six and a half or seven hours. That will increase your production capability to be able to produce accordingly. Likewise, the efficiencies in this instance will also be and could be adjusted because if there's been an improved efficiency over the period of uh, your control, that machine number one has moved from efficiency from 85 to 95%, that too would increase the rate of production and help to reduce your overall cost. What we have down, then down below would be a culmination of the number of hours that we have available to us as it relates to the three machines put together for these um, identified here in the total hours for the month. This is going to be the required production hours and then it will determine whether we have a, a surplus or a shortfall. Now the, 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 the numbers here might be a little bit out because I haven't approved all of the documents, I haven't made my adjustments, so a lot of these may still change, but it'll give somebody the opportunity to look at it and make the appropriate adjustments as they go forward. 
As we can see, that is then defined for each and every machining department, the finishing department, and the assembly department in their consolidated solutions. We then go and have a look at the labor stats, and this could be a separate document altogether, but I put it on here so that it's a closer correlation to be able to look at. Here we have the stats that relate to the number of shifts, the hours per shift, etc., to be able to give you what the labor cost is for each machine based on the average labor cost per, per laborer, uh, the number of laborers that you have, and that's the average machine cost. Now keep in mind that we can do the development of these, these details on a labor uh, budget either by way of the machine, or as I've done here, I've taken to consolidate these and average these out to get to that as a, an average number of those, uh, those three machines. We identify what is the available hours that the laborers would work, which is a little different from what they are, I mean, what they're going to be paid for versus different from what they may be working if you're paying for tea times and, and lunch times. If you're not, then those numbers will be in accordance with what you have as manufacturing times. These would be the required numbers, and then again the surplus, seeing if we're going to pay them or not pay them. But the ultimate point behind this is, and we can structure all of the uh, calculations to suit whatever you're doing with this. So in other words, if you want to uh, let people go early because this is the net real result that you have so many hours, you probably would want to let some folks go and or let them go home early, in which case you don't have that, that cost. But if that was the case that you carried this cost, that would be the total amount of labor hours at normal time. Now, as you can see, we've got uh, 31 hours extra in this particular one, and that's going to cost us a total of 15, a total of 2,000 extra, and a total of 4,000 extra as we move along the line to be able to get to the point where we can calculate what the labor cost is for each and every one of these machine types. Now, from with that, and notwithstanding that, we have the, the ability then, furthermore, is to go and build a materials or related materials document, which in this case, we try to keep it very simple. And there's going to be two aspects to this template. One is to define exactly what the total standard cost is for building bass boats. For, and obviously, these are models. It would be uh, quite ridiculous if these were big, large boats, although it would be nice. But uh, what we've identified here is what might be the standard cost. Do we want to have any safety stock uh, that we want to build into this thing? And it might be as a percentage of each and every month. So we want to build 5% of, of that month's stock. Uh, the calculation on how we want to build this for you as a particular organization, we would change the template, change the calculation, because we know one size does not fit all. Here we would identify then what the numbers are that are produced that we'd bring in. And for each and every one of these boats or types of boats, we know what that is for January, February, March, April, May, all the way through, and then for the different boats. And this is what the material cost will be by multiplying those out. Now, one further comment here is that if bass boats, you would like to break each and every one of these items out into their subcomponents, in other words, the lower sets of, of raw materials, then we can break that out. That's no big deal. We did this really to highlight how this could be done, but to shorten the exercise so it doesn't become too long and too convoluted. And then we would have a look at what we need to purchase in order to make sure that we have, uh, on the assumption that we have a, an immediate turnaround, that we would have exactly this kind of requirement that will be carried forward. Now, Here's one further portion that we added into this, and that would be the likes of your accounts payable schedule, where we would bring in the total purchases that have to be made, of which it was 28,000. We know that um, of our purchases, 73 are paid net 30, 27 are paid net 60. If we had some that were paid in cash, then we would bring them in into a separate line as well so that we could build that. And these numbers would then be used both for the cash budget as well as for the balance sheet um, numbers as well that you would carry forward. So insofar as these numbers are then concerned, you can see that the percentage of 28, 70% is carried in here, 73% uh, is carried into February, 27 is carried into March, and so those numbers will be calculated going out forward. 
Now, the next one that I'd like to highlight would be the overhead. Remember we spoke about the overhead. I've put a little color to this particular screen so that it just didn't become a set of numbers. But again, structured in whatever fashion you like. We have the uh, direct and indirect expenses that are applied to your factory. These are the amounts that, that would be in there. These would be the increases and or decreases that you would identify either by virtue of the, as, as, the assumptions or the global assumptions or some other form that we have there. And more importantly here is what we've got is the budget and we're going to apply that across the board in uh, this fashion that we have as it relates to utilities. So utilities will be apportioned according to our initial breakout by uh, let's let's assume that that's going to be kilowatt usage and these are the percentages and so it will calculate the numbers ultimately for each and every machine and then get you to make sure that this is a total budget that has been spread appropriately. Once these have all been spread and identified we can then come up with a machine rate per hour for each machine and then we can consolidate those machine or average those machine hours and come up with the total production requirements for each month and what that's going to result in in the actual cost of which if you have a GL cost for the machine centers then that would become your budgeted number and that would become the budget number for finishing and that would be your budgeted number for the assembly. Uh, in this case I've taken the shortcut and said what is my overall burden rate for my overall factory there it is there and identified that this is my budget cell and this is what's going to be picked up by my documents going forward in order to come up with my total expenses as compared to my uh, executive target. The next thing that I want to show is a more simplified version of a, an expense report and this could be for your SGNA. Uh, we could have certain documents that feed into this that may help with things like your depreciation schedules. They could be built and they would just be the, be calculated appropriately so that you never have to do that again and those could be brought in and built into this line here but for the sake of ease we have the expense line here we have the executive target that we have there the adjustments that we may want to put in to be able to come up with the new target spread over the periods of months and normally these are uh, calculated on an even keel basis all the way through the period. This could be done not only for the finance team and for the SGNA expenses in itself, but also for other departmental expenses if they had and you wanted them to budget a, a template accordingly. When all of these are done and they've all been recommended, and each and every one of these will then need to be recommended, those numbers then get rolled up and get compared to the executive target. So here's an example of what an executive target might look like. There's the number that we had from the executive target. These are the numbers that we have so far made an adjustment and recommended. You clearly we're not anywhere close. This tells me I'm only at 80, I'm 81 percent short of the number that I, I have. So you can set these targeted numbers and if there was a case of being able to push these uh, percentages out, oops, I apologize, out you can see that the percentages over here, uh, the, which were at 5%, at if I've set the tolerance at 5%, they would go away, versus if it was at 4%, they'd be back. And I could go and then have a look and identify why are these numbers that different. Now, when all of that is um, completed and you not only saved this but you've ticked off each and every one of these line items then as far as the budget is concerned relative to the PL side of the budget that would then be approved and be signed off by your CFO or, or chief person in finance your controller your budget manager whomever and that would be saved recommended and this will be then the sets of numbers that will be used in building and, you, and, and reporting against in your budgeted numbers going forward. We don't stop there because now some of these numbers are then taken forward and as you can imagine on the purchaser side and on the balance sheet side, the balance sheet is, is to be built. But more importantly what I'd like to show here is that we carry this forward into the, the likes of what you could have as a cash budget and here's a, a simple template to highlight that particular situation where you have an opening balance, 
you have the cash collected from AR, cash sales, etc. And these again could be broken up into the 60, 30, 90 days, depending on how you collect your cash, how your customers pay. These are your cash disbursements, also broken up into what you have in terms of the cash payments and or your credit, and then all the other expenses that you'll pay on a monthly basis to come up with the total disbursements. Any um, balances that you may need from an operating per perspective that you'd like to have as cash available. And here's some of your debt servicing that you may want to have in terms of your loan repayments, interest payments to net out a cash balance and show you what your ultimate cash position is going forward. Now, just to highlight a couple of points that we spoke about, these are documents that then become very valuable to you from an from not only the pure finance perspective, but from a planning perspective, from an understanding as to how your company is either going to be burdened by additional sales, by higher costs, inflation, sp supply chain, and the various other aspects. If you need to make a change to any one of these documents, because during the period of the first three months or during the period of preparation of this budget for the end of the year, you come across a new customer who wants to come in, you would be able to build that in go in, make the appropriate adjustments, make the recommendations, and all of that information will flow through to be able to show you what this looks like. The, in each and every case, if you wanted to take these numbers and make the appropriate adjustments to the sales and or the production and or other costs that there may be, including the global variables, if the global variables were used across the board and they didn't get to be changed, then those could be used as well to come up with your quarterly forecasts and you could save it as a quarterly forecast. And then once you've recommended that, that's what you would then use in your reporting. And in the financial reporting part of it, you'd use the name of what you've then finalized this as, let's say, your first quarter's forecast. Now, just to show you that insofar as the budget is concerned, you can see how far everybody's working. Um, here is a list of an example of all of the templates that had to be sent out for sales. And with each and every one of these that have been approved, you will have a little green thumb that says dealer A is complete for VP of the East, but they haven't yet got to the point of completion. So it's an easy method to be able to follow and get to the point of identifying that this number here is ready to be reviewed and objectively approved or disapproved or evaluated and checked out. So with that, um, I'm going to stop our conversation here and lead you to the next portion, which is all about how to budget successfully and how to avoid certain mistakes. Thanks very much for listening.